Now that we've done all of these inductive proofs, you might be wondering, why does induction work this way? Why do these proofs all have the same common format? Why even is this a valid way to do reasoning and to do proof? That's a deep question, and one that really you need to take a class on mathematical logic to explore the depths of. I do touch on it a bit in CS4160. But let me try to give you a little bit of the intuition here. Every type that we define comes along with what's called an induction principle. The induction principle for a type is what tells us how to structure inductive proofs on that. So basically, it tells us what we need to show for base cases, for inductive cases, and what we get to assume in the inductive cases, which is to say the inductive hypothesis. We do have to be a little bit careful here with the phrase inductive hypotheses. Some authors use it in various ways. Uh, as I've used it here, it's what we assume in the inductive case, but some people will use it to refer to the property P being proved. Uh, that's not how I use it. That's not how Koch uses it, um, but it is how some people. So the induction principle for natural numbers, which uh, you learned at least in CS2800 and maybe in other places as well, can be stated as follows. It says, for all properties P, if P holds of zero, and then as a kind of separate logical statement here, for all K, PK implies PK plus one, then we can conclude that for all N, P holds of N. So I've color coded this here. Let me flip back to the previous slide. The base cases, inductive cases, and inductive hypotheses. You can see those color coded here. Okay, so that's the induction principle. But why is that the induction principle? And why is that a valid reasoning technique? Well, there are various metaphors that you can use before actually proving this in a logic class. But here's one metaphor I like, and that's of dominoes. Imagine that you have a chain of dominoes. Now, in this metaphor, P holding means you can knock down a domino. So if P holds of zero, that means you can knock down that very first domino that's shown there. And then the middle line here with the red, which says that if you can knock over domino K, then you're also able to knock over domino K plus one. That's sort of saying that the dominoes are spaced and, and oriented in the right way. Right? If one falls, then it will cause the next one to fall, and so forth and so on. Okay, so if you can establish that you are able to knock over the first domino, and if you can establish that knocking over one domino causes the next domino to fall, then you've established that you can knock over all of the dominoes. That is the essence of why induction works here, and that's why the induction principle is stated this way. All right, so for NAT, our data type that we define for natural numbers, as, as opposed to sort of hijacking the built-in integers, uh, the induction principle looks almost exactly the same. And that should be no surprise, because we know how closely related nat and natural numbers are. So if p holds of z is the base case, uh, the inductive case in the middle here, uh, if we know that p holds of k, and that implies p holds of the successor of k, then we're able to conclude that p holds of all nats. It's the same underlying metaphor of dominoes. What about lists? It's the same thing again. We're just showing that if P holds of that smallest case, the empty list, and that if we can show P holds of any tail T, that implies that P holds of a list that's one bigger because we added one thing onto it. Um, think of that as like adding on one domino to the chain, if you will. Then P holds of all lists. Now, finally, what about trees? This gets a little more complicated, but it's really kind of the same. Uh, if P holds of a leaf, and if for all ways of building up the components of a node, so a value, a left subtree, and a right subtree, if you know that P holds of L and P holds of R, then that implies P holding of that bigger node than P holds of all trees. So here the domino metaphor still applies. It's just a little harder to think about. Uh, the leaves are all the way back at the back of this picture, hard to see. But we're sort of saying that if you can knock over those leaves way there in the background, and if any time two branches of the tree come together and join up, if both of those fall and therefore knock over the next domino that's at sort of the next branch up in the tree, then eventually we'll be able to knock over all of the dominoes in the tree 
reaching the root, which is at the closest end to us in this picture. Finally, there is an interesting relationship here between induction and recursion. I think of inductive proofs like recursive programs. In fact, if you take 4160, you will see exactly what I mean by that because they really will be recursive programs. So here's a little bit of intuition about what I mean by that. Let's compare proofs and programs. And let's think about the data types we define. For each constructor of a data type that we define, in a proof, we typically have one proof case. So think about lists. We had a base case for nil and an inductive case for com. Think about trees. We had a base case for leaf. We had an inductive case for node. So that's one proof case per constructor. Similarly, when we write programs, if we're writing a, re a function on one of these data types, we typically will have one pattern matching branch um, per constructor in that function. So if you want to know what the, the length of a list is, uh, you have a pattern matching branch for nil and one for com. If you want to know what the size of a tree is, you have a branch for leaf and a branch for node. Likewise, think about what we do for smaller values of data types. In a proof, we got one inductive hypothesis per smaller value that was involved. Right, so for lists, we got one inductive hypothesis on the tail. For trees, we got two inductive hypotheses, one for the left and one for the right side. Likewise, in programs, when we write functions over these data types, we typically make a recursive call for each smaller value. If you want to determine what the length is of a list, you make one recursive call on the tail. If you want to determine what the size is of a tree, you make two recursive calls on the two subtrees. So there's a lot of similarity here, uh, and inductive proofs really are similar to recursive programs.